Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on Youth Voice and Agency in Disaster Recovery. My name is Bridget Little, and I'm the Senior Project Officer for, the, for Community Resilience at the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience. It's my pleasure to be the host of today's webinar. This is the fourth webinar in Ada's Recovery Matters webinar series, sharing knowledge and good practice for disaster recovery in the wake of the Black Summer bushfires. Today we have three guest speakers, but before I introduce them, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands on which we meet today. Here in Melbourne, I acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Talking about recovering from disasters can be a difficult topic for many people. In today's webinar, we will hear about how disasters impact children and youth, and a first-hand account from a speaker with direct experience of the Black Summer bushfires. We mention this in advance in case the content of the webinar raises uncomfortable or distressing feelings for you, and we encourage you to seek support from organisations such as Lifeline and Beyond Blue if you need it. Some housekeeping before we get started. This is our second webinar on the Zoom platform. And while we feel we're getting the hang of it, we ask for your patience should any issues arise. A common question is, will this webinar be available to watch later? And the answer is yes. We'll be recording this webinar and up uploading it to the Knowledge Hub. We will send you an email with the link when it is ready. All attendees are muted by default. You can use the chat function to introduce yourself and share thoughts and comments. However, we ask that if you have a question, please use the question and answer feature, not the chat box. As attendees, you'll be able to upvote questions that you'd like answered by clicking the thumbs up button. And I'll do my best to ask a number of these to our presenters during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. We are very fortunate to have three speakers with us today. Margaret Nixon from the Australian Child and Adolescent Trauma Loss and Grief Network, Annabelle Axford from Emerging Minds, and Brodie Gordian from the Sanctuary Malakuta Youth Group. So let's get started and I'll introduce our first two speakers who are presenting together. Our first presenters are Margaret Nixon and Annabelle Axford. Annabelle has over 30 years nursing and midwifery experience with over 25 years based in rural and regional healthcare settings in both Australia and overseas. Her experience has included local and regional emergency and disaster response and recovery. And she is currently working at national level for Emerging Minds, the National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health as a senior child mental health workforce consultant, rural and remote. Margaret has over 20 years experience in education and research in the field of children and young people's mental health, wellbeing and trauma. She has worked in various education settings in Australia and overseas, and is currently a senior trauma specialist at the Australian Child and Adolescent Trauma Loss and Grief Network at the Australian National University. Over to you, Margaret. Hi, thanks, Bridget, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to hearing um, what our second group, second speakers are also going to be speaking about. And Annabelle and I are going to focus firstly on really understanding the impacts of hazards such as the fires that we have seen uh, this summer on children and young people, how we can best support children and young people, and also thinking about hope and community engagement. Um, so just to start off with, if um, we start thinking about these topics, these are enormous topics that we have to cover. And we will just, Annabelle and I will be touching just um, 
really just that the bones of these topics, but we will let you know right from the outset that we have a number of resources that will be uploaded onto the website as soon as this webinar becomes live. And you'll be able to refer to these. These are all free and online. There are PDF sheets, videos, podcasts, there are apps, there are e-learnings, um, and you can freely access these and you can use them to support your work, but also to pass on to the families and children that you support. Before I start uh, any further, I just want to also um, acknowledge the experience that each of you bring and the relationships that you have with the communities that you work in and the areas that you work in. And so as you listen to us speaking today, I hope that you keep bringing that knowledge and experience to mind and that you're able to hear some of the things that we're saying and be able to link onto those things that will really help support that the work that you do. Um, the impact of hazard events such as the fires that we have just seen over the summer for children and young people is something that we have to consider. Children and adults are vulnerable to trauma. Um, and when a significant event such as the fires occurs, it's not just individuals, but we know that it's whole communities, that it's whole families that are all impacted. So when we're thinking this afternoon about children and young people, we have to think about them within the environment, within that environment of their family, within the environment of their local community. We have to keep that in mind. One of the things that the overarching things that events such as fires bring is a loss of a sense of safety. This is an enormous, uh, an enormous upheaval for children and for young people and for adults. These events mean that there are a lot of changes, that there's a disruption to routines, and it's these very routines and relationships are the things that hold and nurture our young people and our children. So it's very complex when we look at um, what the impacts can be for children and young people. And we need to be considering also that parents who are often the main source of this comfort and the source of these healing relationships are themselves in grief and in loss and trying to, to make sense of the experience that they've also had. Um, we will be looking, um, Annabelle will be touching on uh, a little bit further around how we re-establish this sense of safety. Now, one of the things is to think about what might these impacts look like for ages and stages across children and young people. And I have to say that there is no right or wrong reaction and no right or wrong response. Each child and young person will have a different response. Some may be more intense, some may be more internal, some may be more external. Some may seem to be managing okay, but further down the track, things start to change and happen. Children who were not actually in or experienced the actual fire may also be um, dealing with stress. They may have been away and yet coming back to their community, a community that is traumatised, is something that they too will be um, or may be feeling a sense of being overwhelmed with what's going on. Um, tourists who were in an area and then left an area also going back to a community that hasn't been impacted will also have their way of dealing. So I notice as in looking at some of the people that are um, participating, they're not in areas particularly that experience the fires, but there is no doubt particularly, um, for example, a community like Canberra where a number of people were impacted because they knew of people or family were living in areas. For children, the perception of threat is something to keep in mind. Children and young people um, may perceive the threat differently from parents. So while parents might be considering the loss of life, children may be considering the loss of pets. 
and we can often miss what is being the most, um, uh, what children or young people are most concerned about. And we need to just remember that when we're talking about children and young people, we are talking right from very young children. They do experience um, these, that, these events as events that can be very traumatic for them. Behaviours that you might see in children and young people, and I'm going to just give you again a broad brush around these, and we have resource sheets that will help you. Um, then they will go through ages and stages. But really, the thing is to look for changes in behaviour. Those changes that might be uh, ones that, that you might see now, but also changes that are being expressed further on, six months on, 12 months on. So those changes, changes a child may be more withdrawn, not wanting to go out and see other children, not wanting to go back and join in once things are, are open. Um, trouble concentrating, being more flighty, um, distressed, more shouting, um, less of a fuse, um, being able to manage changes that happen. You might notice that there are changes in things such as um, uh, developmental milestones. It may be a child, for a young child, maybe they have started bedwetting, whereas they weren't, weren't before. What we can see and what uh, with older young people is that they take on the parenting role. And that's not to say that kids stepping up is not something that is a great thing to see. But when they start taking on that parent role of caring and worrying so much around what is happening, that's something that we really need to care keep um, an eye on. You might also see changes in how um, children are expressing or feeling things. Um, they may be way more anxious and worried. They may look like they are extremely burdened and weighed down, intense and overwhelmed, or a mixture all, of all of these. Now, I just need to say that these sorts of responses are quite um, quite normal within for people who have experienced a traumatic event. And we need to, yes, be aware of them, be watching for them. And if you are hearing from the, the families that you're working with or from the children and young people themselves that these are persisting or that these are getting worse, then absolutely there needs to be um, a sense of linking them in and a GP or paediatrician is a great place to start. Um, one of the things that has added to the complexity of this year's fires, and I don't actually need to tell you all, is of course the whole notion of COVID. Um, and that this has really been something that has disrupted not only the handing out and the, the, um, the, the recovery process, but also those things within our communities that help with the recovery process. We know that from um, uh, some of the work we've done with the fires, the communities that experienced fires in 2009, one of the things that was so healing were things like the weekly barbecue that was just put on as a pop-up event that grew into a really important thing. These are things we haven't been able to do, healing events within communities. And so finding ways now that as things ease that we can start to be able to reintroduce these. One of the things though, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit a little bit later, is also looking at how this may give an opportunity to reconsider uh, what are the things that we will regather and, and continue and what are the things that you may change. And we might look at this a bit later on if we look at hope and post-traumatic growth. Um, I'm going to hand over to Annabelle, who's going to speak to you um, a little bit more about how we can best support children and young people who have experienced hazards and the bushfires. Um, so if we move to the next slide, please. Thank you, Margaret. Um, hello, everyone. Um, please, I do recognise that we've got a lot of expertise already on there. So please make sure that you do draw your own experiences to this 
um, presentation as well. Um, some of the things that, um, just to let you know, Emerging Minds has actually got a community trauma toolkit, which Margaret and myself are on that team. So as she's mentioned, these are all freely available. And one of the things that we actually um, have actually come up with, because there's a lot of psychological first aid for young people, there's a lot of psychological first aid for adults, but we've actually adapted that framework by the WHO to psychological first aid for children. So these are the five key areas in which we'll support children, particularly the ones under the age of 12. And I know that this is actually for youth, but I will, so I will be talking about youth as well. We just really wanna recognise that um, the experiences that are happening in the community at the moment are very much um, on a roller coaster. And for some of the communities that I've been um, involved in, uh, probably the, one of the key things is we will have another summer. And I know that the discussions are already happening about how we're going to prepare for the next summer. So I think if we're looking at that type of stuff, I think that it's most important to involve children and young people in both the recovery, but also the preparedness of, of the next season. Um, some of the things regarding safety is thinking about the legal aspects of safety, um, which um, I, I won't go into in the respect from the child protection point of view, um, but also looking at that environmental and setting. So we're actually considering what has changed and what has been lost in communities. And I think we have to be very conscious of a lot of um, families and children and young people have lost their home, their school, their sporting clubs, their communities, just their day-to-day -day living experience has been lost. And it's about finding that new normal. So I think it's actually really when you're with working with young people and children, really acknowledging that what has been um, lost and what they've been exposed to regarding that. The other thing I'd like to mention is the media. Um, and that is about how do we actually shield children from the media, um, which comes in multiple different forms. I won't go into that in detail, but we have actually got some media guidelines and support for that, um, um, that we can actually provide. Emotional safety. Um, I think one of the things when you're actually starting to work with young people and children is you need to ask yourself, are you ready to hear what they are going to say to you? And I think, one of the key things in working in this space is actually the self-care in which you need to do for yourself to make sure that you are ready to hear what is going to be, the stories that are going to be told. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and going back to that level of threat that Margaret was talking about, about how a child perceives it compared to a parent. In other words, being separated from a parent is more distressing than actually probably losing the property at that point in time. So you have to think about the ages and stages of children where teenagers, a lot of teenagers were worried about their peers. So in other words, what's happening to their peers more than what was actually happening to their parents because based on where, children, where teenagers are in their growth and development, how important their peers become to them. Um, so, the, one of the key resources that we do have on their website is actually how to communicate with children across the ages and stages about adversity. So that's a step-by-step -step guide that we can actually um, have uploaded so that you can actually have a look at that, about how to communicate with babies, toddlers, um, primary school age children and teenagers. Keeping calm, I think, is really, really important and really being that open um, empathetic, genuine and, and showing the, the respect for uh, children and young people because they bring a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of experience from their world. Um, just remember you don't have to answer all their questions. Um, you know, and if you do need to answer them, answer them honestly. But the problem is when you're answering honestly, make sure that you navigate the uncertainty with them. And that's what I mean. If you don't know the answer, um, you know, just listen and reassure and try and find the answer gen together with them. Regarding connecting with others, 
and that's very much back to understanding the level of threat which is def um, which is in our resources as well so based on where they are and what psychological supports they need the other thing is with connection is about connecting to um, family time or whatever that time is and actually creating a new um, sense of routine and rules one of the key things with you know, we are all run by rules and routine. You know, we're all got on at two o'clock today or 1.30 if you're in the other states or even different if you're in Western Australia. But we've all got on at different times. So we're actually set to a routine and rules where children enjoy that routine and rules. And this, um, the in a disaster situation, that is definitely disrupted. And so therefore, it's really, really important to try and get... Um, with when connecting with families and stuff to try and get back to those routines and rules, um, which is very important. The other is how do we encourage self-efficacy in children? You know, it's actually really drawing on their strengths. But the best, you know, thing is to really listen and really think about um, don't form assumptions, don't try and have solutions, but actually hear what they're really saying. Because sometimes it's the end of the conversation that you actually finally get the vital piece of information. The, for us, is it's not about surveys and it's not about, you know, the tick box option. It's actually being and living in that experience with the child or the young person and being able to connect them based on their interests and needs are really important. And as we all know, that if someone is starting to get distressed, the best way is slow breathing. And I don't know how many times I've used that as a nurse in an A&E department or out in the field regarding the, you know, that really slow breathing is so important to calm everyone down. For me, it's actually about having hope. And hope can mean different things to different people. And it's based on those reactions. Um, but most importantly is, um, you know, which a lot of um, other people have spoken about probably in different settings that you've heard, is don't try and tell children to be good or be brave or stop being silly. Their reaction or their behaviours is based on what they've experienced. So it's actually trying to understand their experience and their reaction. And the important thing is for um, children is, is those small planned things. So sometimes it could be just all sitting down to tea together for and actually put your phones away and actually have tea together as a family, wherever the family might be, is really, really important. And we know that with community groups, as Margaret spoke about, the COVID-19 has added definitely complexity to that. The other uh, thing is parents play or the adults play a key role in supporting um, children and young people. We actually have um, an app for parents um, that they can actually go through, which is based on the ages and stages and behaviour reactions. So if parents are really could actually just go through that app and pick out you know, my, son, my son's called William. Um, I could go through his and look at his behaviours and what's changed. It also gives small little tips for parents of actually how to manage that, but also when you might need to have psychosocial support or go and see your GP. So that's just a few things that we've got up there. We have got a number of videos about, you know, what to expect and um, how to support with um, some fact sheets and videos on that from the short term and long term. So I will leave it at that and I'll hand back to Margaret. Next slide, please. <coughs> Thanks, Annabelle. Um, I'm just going to continue very briefly from what uh, Annabelle was speaking about and talking about the role um, and of hope and communities as part of the recovery. Um, when we start looking at hope and, and growth and post-traumatic growth, we really need to be um, aware that 
what we are talking about is something that is grounded in the reality of where people are at and is not being put across as something that is dismissing the space that our communities are in. To start talking about post-traumatic growth or um, trying to put too much of a sweetened layer around the experiences that a community has been through can be seen as being callous and quite um, offensive almost. So, Yet we also know that um, it is through these sorts of experiences that people do change and that there is a growth that comes. It's just around making sure that we are aware of what is going on and where our communities are up to if we're starting to have these discussions. Um, we know that uh, when we start listening to the things about COVID, that people have started talking about they're going to start reflecting on what, what is the new normal they want to get back to. And uh, very early on um, in the bushfires over the summer, there was an article that came out where uh, one somebody who had learned many lessons, including from the 2009 fires, was this is an opportunity for communities to get together and to consider what recovery looks like, what their new normal will look like. Um, and young people and children can play an incredible part in this, a part that will be healing for them and will bring about this sense of belonging, a sense of agency and control. And this is what, you know, whole communities have lost, uh, this sense of things are happening to them outside of their control. So to be able to give that control back, as Annabelle said, through listening, through being respectful in how you're engaging with children and young people, as you your community starts to restore and starts to grow and starts to recover. Um, one of the things in when we're engaging with children and young people is to make sure that we are engage, engaging in a way that has substance. As Annabelle said, it's around creating spaces that are spaces they're wanting, listening to what it is that they want to express, going in without judgment around what we know as adults, we know what your problem is. We've read the research, we know your problem. It's going in with an open mind, hearing what is it that is the main issue for them? What would they like to see in recovery? What does recovery mean for them? And some of these can be confusing when you, or, or surprising when you uh, listen, sit down and listen to what are the things that are impacting children and young people. It might be things such as missing out on their year 12 dance or their grade six graduation or the Deb ball or the, the footy trophy night, but it can also be holding that stress of what their family is going through. But until we sit down and hear from them and listen without judgment, then we can't really start engaging in in, in um, this building and this recovery. When we engage with children and young people within a community, in a recovery space, we're not only helping them to identify what's important to them, we're allowing them to identify what they have to offer to our community. And so for them, it's a chance to say, look, yes, all this stuff has happened, but I have something I can offer back. I have someone who is listening to me and somebody who is hearing what I have to say. When this happens and we give this voice and sense of agency to children and young people within our communities, it becomes a community for all. And that then the growth of that community is something that is flourishing more than, and it gives an opportunity for this, this community to flourish more with the voices of their children and young people. And this in turn will provide the young people and their families the sense of connection and safety and routines that they need as they thrive. I'm finishing there and we'll hand over to the Nick or back to Bridget before we hear how this has actually been put into action. Thank you. Thanks so much, Annabelle and Margaret. We'll be answering some questions at the end, so I'll go straight on to introducing Brody. Brody grew up in Malakuta, a rural community which was hit hard by the 2019-2020 bushfires in East Gippsland, Victoria. In response to this disaster, 
Brody has supported a crew of amazing locals aged 12 to 25 to establish a youth-led community-based association and drop-in service known locally as the Sanctuary Malakuta Youth Group. The Sanctuary emerged because young people in Malakuta needed a place to gather, support each other and organise without, whilst being cut off from electricity, internet, daylight and the rest of the world during the summer of 2020. In the short time since, it has become a respected, inspiring and effective me mechanism of grassroots leadership, mutual aid and representation as Malakuta overcomes the bushfires and looks towards an uncertain post-COVID future. Welcome, Brody. Hi, thank you so much everybody for having me. Um, thanks all the participants for joining in. Um, and thanks AIDR for having us. And thank you so much, Margaret and Animal from, uh, Annabelle from Emerging Minds, because everything that you said was so spot on to our experience. Um, I don't have a background in, in youth work, um, so I'm informed by my experience as being a young person in Malakuta. And yeah, and it's really, really, really inspiring to hear about your research um, because it's so true to our, our experiences here and, and the reason that we've done what we have with the sanctuary. Um, so we're in Malakuta. Um, as mentioned, we got pretty hit really hard um, with the fires. Usually, um, people that visit Malakuta associate our town with the pictures that you can see on the screen before you. Um, and a long winding drive along the one road in and out of our town. Um, beautiful wilderness coast, camping, wildlife, unique biosphere and all the coastal recreational activities of fishing and boating and surfing and things. Um, the local shops have always sold stickers um, to tourists with slogans like Victoria's best kept secret um, or Malakudu, you'll never want to leave. And um, if we can see the next, um, yeah, and, and then what happened over New Year's has um, given a really ironic <laughs> twist to some of those um, touristic slogans. So the Malakuta in district um, is made up of Malakuta, Genoa, Wongrabel, Wiragua, Mar Maramingo Creek, Wallagra, Gypsy Point and Roxham. And we're really close to our neighbours in um, Can River and Club Terrace and then over the border in Eden and, and further up north as well, um, who were also all really affected by the fires. Um, Growing up in Malakuta is all the tourist experience and, and very much more. It's beautiful, it's really isolated and isolating. Uh, the experience of youth uh, growing up here is shaped by our surroundings and our location. Um, the approximate population here is about 1,163 at the last census count, um, and the median age is 58 years old. So, the category of youth, um, as defined between 12 and 25 years of age, makes up roughly 10% of the population um, at around 112 individuals. Um, and we're not sure how this might change in response to the fires as families work out where they go from here. Um, and into the next slide is what more recently and more widely Malakuta has become known for. Um, these really dramatic scenes of people sheltering down the beach as um, on December the 31st, 2019, the fire swept over Malakuta. Um, we had a bit of warning. The emergency services knew that this was coming, um, whether that got higher up in government adequately or not. Ooh, who's to say? Um, and it result, this fire resulted in up to 25% of the houses um, being destroyed. Um, the one road in and out of Malakuta was closed off well into February um, and that meant that um, not only were people unable to get out unless they took the routes of um, evacuation by naval, air, naval ship or um, being airlifted out, but it also meant that families that were on holidays or families that evacuated early were unable to get back into town until well into February as well. Um, and as Margaret and Annabelle mentioned, like the effects of trauma on young people and, and the, the dynamics of that 
come in lots of different ways and and um, it's really important to acknowledge that bushfire affected or disaster affected means a whole outcome and being a community member or witnessing what's happening on the television just as much as actually being present um, as the fire came over. Um, other detrimental effects have been um, loss of income, um, jobs, um, not having like a, but like already we were really set back in the education year and, and um, a lot of young people were already really concerned about the effects that um, the bushfires would have on their education before COVID even became a thing. Um, and the smoke cloud stayed around for weeks. There was, um, for the first week or two of January, there was very low visibility and it was very difficult to breathe. Um, so even the healthiest of people living here, um, yeah, had that anxiety and the, those really justified anxieties about what kind of ongoing health effects could be felt. Um, and similarly with concerns about asbestos um, being blown around from houses. And so there are some families that still haven't returned back to Malakuta and whether that's because they're still waiting for their house to get cleared and find um, alternative accommodation or because they're worried about those ongoing potential risks. Um, of the, so usually at that time of year, there's like up to about 10,000 um, tourists and in addition to the local population, um, by the fire, time the fire came through, there was about 4,000 um, people in town and approximately 3,000 of those people were evacuated by aircraft and naval ship. Um, as the fire front came over, as was well documented in the media, um, people sheltered by the water. Um, me and my family were down at the wharf. There was also the makeshift refuge center set up at the downtown hall where we um, have summer cinema, um, where a lot of people beach as well. Um, Many, oh yeah. So as um, Margaret and Annabel mentioned before, it is really important to know the media attention and the effect that that has have had on people um, in its own challenges. So there's, as an example, there's this iconic um, photo of one of the young, um, the young boys um, steering his family to safety in a, in a boat, which was shared widely. I think it was even on the cover of the New York Times or something without his family's permission. And um, then he was subjected to like being hunted down by camera crews like a rare bird um, during that time as well. And, um, and another local young man who was, um, who was noticed for his amazing work rescuing, searching and rescuing for burnt and injured wildlife and koalas, um, but then also getting totally lambasted in the media for, for hunting deer and um, not having that opportunity to, to, to speak from your own story and, and have the faith that those, um, your perspective will be um, authentically reproduced in the media and shared. Um, so it's been a crash course for a lot of young local people in um, being on the world stage and the harsh introduction to how um, how unethical some of the um, media's um, practices can be and sensation sensationalized. Um, and since it was our personal experience um, that was really unpredictable and, and we were all really seeking to understand what was happening to us, it was really difficult to tune out of that, um, our, our own stories mediated by screens um, and media. And, um, and then all of that, our experiences being mixed up with the political rhetoric and anxiety around larger factors such as climate change and um, uh, disappointment in the government and our leaders, state, state national leaders reactions. And so we really need to recognize that that's a huge, being the young people um, that are exposed to. Um, and as, as Margaret and Nanabel mentioned before, like we really need to, um, to be going on this journey with young people together and seeing them as experts in their own uh, situations and recovery and um, perspectives. And 
being willing to commit to, to going through those challenges of asking questions and, um, and um, navigating the media space and the information alongside them. Um, on to the next photo. Um, so there were a bunch of pressures and traumas that we were simultaneously facing. So road closure, couldn't get out or back in. Um, totally, young people are totally dependent on the choices of their parents. Um, Dr. Rob Gordon has been quite present. Um, he's a, a, an amazing trauma psychologist. And one thing that he made um, a big point of from early on was that these traumatic circumstances can be the first instance um, for young people to, to see their, their parents in a real state of distress and also not knowing what to do. This is the first time that some people might get the insight that their parents don't have all of the answers and um, are also really vulnerable. Um, and that's, that's a huge aspect of trauma for young people to overcome. Um, there wasn't any internet or electricity. There was a lot, a lot of dead um, and dying wildlife out and about as well, washing, like birds washing up on the shore and, and just these horrific scenes um, and awareness of, the injury um, and devastation faced by our wildlife and wilderness. Um, of course, some young people lost homes, um, missed out on the summer, which is always a big and much anticipated event of the year because it's like the best opportunity to socialize and make new friends and um, play out different identities and um, you know work part time, start saving up for, for your life after Malakuta if that's what you decide to do on finishing school. Um, the town also had at least as many military uniforms walking around our streets and driving tanks up and down the roads as civilians. Um, due to the fuel shortage, most vehicles on the roads were military trucks or emergency service vehicles because there was such um, rations on, on people being able to drive around. Um, and again, this lasted well into February. So this was up to six weeks of that really intense um, situation. So that's the context um, that the sanctuary arose in um, and that the need for a space for young people to get together um, became abundantly clear. On to the next slide. So these are some images of um, the, um, the SES crew and volunteers and young people um, getting together to try to make a, a beautiful space for people to drop into, into the centre of town. Um, as a little bit of background, um, I grew up in Malakuta, but I haven't lived here since I left school. Um, and that was about 10 years ago. And um, my partner and I were actually just visiting for the night so that, because um, we were based in Glasgow last year and he was just getting to know my family and that kind of thing. So we, we just came to visit for a night for New Year's Eve and are still here now, obviously. Um, <laughs> after the, so, uh, so we, we stayed to defend um, my auntie's property and after the main event um, had passed, we started showing up at the local SES shed to see what we could do to help. He was whisked away to help save and look after wildlife. Um, and I was helping to cook food um, and doing welfare checks. And one of the SES volunteers that I was helping out um, is a mother of three teenagers and also works at the school. And together we, um, yeah, just decided to start asking um, local landlords of empty shop fronts um, to see if we could take up their spaces and just, just start moving things in to, to create space for young people to gather in. Um, fortunately for us, the manager for, of the old news agency, which closed last year, is an absolute champion um, and the landlord's really generous as well. So they jumped at the chance to um, let us use that space. And in these photos here, that's what you can see is us um, getting together with the SES crew to get rid of the old furniture. And then um, we got some donations from a bunch of like groups and individuals in town. So 
Um, the SES crew moved out the old shelves and furniture, a visiting church youth group who'd evacuated on the HMS Chills lent us couches, a pool table and some games. My mum came in and gave the place a really thorough clean um, and helped out like just supervising the space. Uh, the school lent us a projector and a PA system with tables and chairs and um, a local musician and music teacher lent us a bunch of musical instruments. And by January the 4th, January the 5th, we were open and operating from 12 till 7 p.m. seven days a week. Um, on to the next photo. And so here's some images of, um, yeah, what the space looks like when it's in use. Um, the sanctuary was so named on January the 11th when our members voted unanimously for it to exist as a safe haven for Malakuta's young people to be together support each other and develop our skills as leaders as we recover from the fire events. We became inco incorporated under the Association's Incorporation Reform Act 2012 on February 13th, 2020. Um, the mission of the sanctuary is the pursuit of the following four principles, empowerment, representation, um, Empowerment, representation, consistency and access. Um, and I'll read a little bit about what that means to us um, in, in the words of our youth leaders. So empowerment, the sanctuary is a space which belongs to the youth of Malakuta from which we can organise, form strong interpersonal skills and instill a sense of hope and good footing in the future. Representation. With guidance and the opportunity to access mentoring, members of the sanctuary have increased participation and influence in community decision-making processes. The sanctuary enables community members to access, consult, and seek participation of youth members in town events and decisions. More importantly, it provides youth with the opportunity to invite the community in to support us in ways that they define, uh, that we define as integral to our development as future citizens and leaders. We'll continue to work closely with the Emerging Malacuta and District Recovery Association uh, to ensure youth voices are heard at every stage of our recovery. Consistency. The sanctuary provides events, a drop-in service, opportunities, mechanisms of representation and access to services and information. Its ongoing benefit to the community relies on consistent opening times and routine opportunities for engagement to nurture participation and acknowledgement of the efforts, significance and futures of youth in Malacuta access. An individual is dramatically influenced by their support system. The sanctuary provides pathways for young people to access mentoring, communication, support services and resources in the community from trusted and responsible adults who are able to invest in our future and well-being. And on to the next slide. So the sanctuary is a, is a youth-led community organisation. And that means that the vision and leadership come from young people aged 12 to 25 years old and centres around our wants and needs to the inclusion and benefit of the whole community. We have a youth-led committee who meet weekly to discuss and make decisions about the operation and governance of the sanctuary. I personally work as a youth cause of emails and grant applications and newsletter updates. And um, it's my job to learn about what's available and relate that info back. But everything that I do is answerable to the youth committee. We've just received three months of funding for the purposes of coordination. And we're trialing a system where young leaders are supported to set up as self-employed um, and then invoice for an agreed amount of time spent doing things which need done to keep the sanctuary going, but most importantly are things that they want to do and they want to build skills in for their own futures. Um, for example, our president, our committee chair, spent five hours on the weekend doing a deep clean of the drop-in to make sure that it's COVID safe now that we're starting to reopen um, because everybody's going back to school and spending time together anyway. Um, and it's really exciting to be getting back into the same space. Um, a, another member has been running the weekly radio show on 3MGB local radio and is invoicing for some of the time she spends programming and editing. A group of younger members are putting a proposal together as a social media team so we can find ways to pay for young people to learn and fulfill these vital roles as experts in their own representation and experiences. 
In this way, we not only address some of the power imbalances usually encountered when asking youth leaders to be able to understand and communicate their emerging preferences and choices whilst they navigate them, but we also acknowledge that the fires and COVID have set them back in their opportunities that would usually be available to them. The summer jobs that they'd usually work over the holidays to save up for the future have been cancelled. We are also exploring ways of showing solidarity to a generation whose economic futures are set to be absolutely precarious and uncertain in a COVID and climate affected, like change affected landscape. Adults and decision makers need to start being very sincere in acknowledging that nobody really knows what to expect next and that we need to be innovative and committed to giving future generations a fair go. Um, so we've had all sorts of legends volunteer their time and mentoring and skills um, and all the adults involved in the sanctuary are supported to get a working with children's check if they don't already have one. And we're borrowing child safety codes from and practice from Yakbeth until we get um, the resources to tailor our own policies to our own needs. Um, some things that we're doing together, and I realise that I've already been talking for 20 minutes, so please interrupt me if it's my time to stop and go to Q&A. Um, but some things that we've been up to are putting a band together called the Sanctuary Strings, and before COVID came in, we were playing at community music and barbie get-togethers. Um, we organised two carpentry teachers from Two Sheds Workshop in Bega, to, who specialise in teaching women and children um, woodworking skills to come and make habitat boxes to help the wildlife who were also homeless out in the bush to um, be able to start um, getting on with their lives as well. Um, one of the first events we planned was a cricket match between the young crew versus the military because it was really important that we firstly blow off some steam and get to know each other um, and also not like find ways to, to get over the, the fact that there were so many uniforms that can be quite intimidating in town. So it was great to have seven foot tall army guys playing with seven year old children. Um, and it was a big laugh and it was a great way to normalise some aspects of a very bizarre and challenging circumstances. And onto the last slide. So um, the sanctuary was set up in response to the catastrophic fire event, um, but in the time since it's emerged as a vital youth specific service in our community where there, there never was one before. It's been a really, really big gap in the services here for a long time. Um, and I hope that that's all right, but I'm just gonna to go to the questions and answers now because I think that'll be a lot more dynamic and interesting. So, so thank you. Thanks a lot, Brody. That was fantastic. And just to let you know, although we've had a lot of talking today, we've had a very low drop off rate. So we presume that everyone's pretty interested in what they've heard so far. Um, so I will jump on to questions now and I'll go with this first one here from Mary Bell. The roles and representation of youth in the sanctuary, Brody, is really innovative. How did you create your goals and your direction? Um, we spent a lot of time talking. So right since the beginning, um, the biggest turnout for our weekly events, so we'd, we'd usually be, we're not open seven days a week anymore. It's more four days a week. But consistently, the biggest turnout is on our committee meeting days. Um, and so um, the young people have been super engaged in that, um, that opportunity to talk about what they want. And yeah, I mean, talking to anybody under 25, you're gonna come up with innovative ideas and solutions to problems. So did you just kind of um, come up with the structures around how the committee would work um, and like the democratic principles that you would apply as a group? or were there particular frameworks that you drew upon? Yeah, we're making it up as we go along and we're informed by the youth and their experiences, also the democratic process, the, the process of getting the Malakuta and District Recovery Association Committee set up has been great to, to have going alongside as well, um, because we've been able to see that process and then work it into ourselves. And I think they've learned a lot from our process that they've been able to integrate as well. Thanks, Brody. Right. I'm just going to try and um, pull together a couple of questions that we've had or questions and statements from Graham Davis. Um, he's, one of the questions he was asking was about um, all, all of the community coming together, all people, colleagues, um, parents, wives, husbands and children uh, grieving together in community. How important do you think that um, youth involvement in the broader community is in terms of the recovery process? 
absolutely vital. And um, yeah, COVID's been cruel in that those weekly get togethers where people would get together and talk their stories and share eye contact and cuddles. Um, it's not what we needed. Likewise, COVID slowed things down in a way that has allowed people to, um, to maybe spend more time with their families and not be so pressured to be at work and that kind of thing. So it's a really mixed bag. And from speaking with the young crew last night to get there, or like what was important for them, for me to say today, um, it, they said that it's important to acknowledge that COVID has had its own benefits in strange ways. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really, there's a big effort in our community now to start working on, again, innovative ways to get together and be sharing our stories and, um, and sharing that peer support um, because that's, that's how we move forward. Thanks for that. There's, there's so many questions for, on from that presentation, Brody. There's another one here about um, youth representation on the local um, municipal for Emergency Management Planning Committee. Um, I know that when we've had conversations before, you're, you're extremely stressed, stretched in terms of your resourcing um, related to this youth group. Do you think there are many more opportunities for involvement around emergency management where you live and, and other opportunities, I suppose, as well, to have a voice in decision-making? Yeah, so one example of like a good thing was um, that we got together with um, to, to go to the, there was a community meeting where we, we, the question was posed, do you want to get a recovery association together? And the youth um, members got up and said, yes, but why do you have to be 18 to vote? We want a voice too. And they lowered it to 15. Um, and then there's two of us that were born in the 90s that were, that have been elected onto that committee. So that's a really great example. And I'm one of those people. I'm really I'm proud to be one of those people. Um, on the other hand, I'm finding it really personally difficult at this point in time to understand why it's why we still don't have rent to pay, um, why we still don't have um, any uh, sustainable, like solid kind of funding for the coordination position. Um, it's yeah, it's hard not to get into despairing at times because everybody's so positive about the work that we've been doing. And I spend a huge amount of time speaking to um, organisations about how they might how they want to support but then it keeps getting to that point of like sorry I've pushed as hard as I can and there's just nothing in the budget to help you there's just nothing my boss says no and it's just really hard to see that there's so many good people working in this sector trying to do the right things and that we know that we're doing the right thing um, but we're six months down the track and we really just don't have that financial support yet but we've got a lot of enthusiastic support in other ways and save the children like um, my friends Rachel and Rachel from Bansdale have been phenomenally helpful um, and, and really present here. So, and, and there's been other groups and people that have uh, that offered in kind support and that kind of thing. But hopefully six months from down the track, it won't be this really difficult thing that it is right now to just get rent and a wage. Thanks, Brody. I'm just going to with one last question, and it's around um, uh, connection between young people during COVID or even in the initial stages of recovery when you were setting up your um, youth group and youth centre. Brody, what, what were the ways and what are the ways that young people are connecting in an online space, or is that not really happening? Or what are the alternatives that you've been using to connect with your peers in Malakuta? We have like a Facebook page, which um, I don't think that young people use so much. It's quite a divisive platform. And I think that um, in terms of connection, people, younger people avoid it more now. Um, Image-based sharing such as Snapchat and TikTok um, and Instagram, people use a bit more. But there, I would say there's really no um, substitute for face-to-face connection and um, you know humans are so tactile and, and social creatures that we need to be playing and hanging out and teasing and you know being creative and playful and in the same space as each other. Malakuta's 
really fortunate in that there's so much space outside to play and so people can still go surfing and chat to each other while maintaining distance um so you know we're not facing the same issues that people living in apartment blocks in cities are um but peer support is where it's at 100 percent like young people supporting young people and having access to older people when they want it and 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 that trust and those trusting relationships they're so vital but um but young people need their peers of similar ages and diverse ages to to really get the support they need and give the support they need that's also really important thanks Brody. i'm gonna and i'm going to wrap up for today so on behalf of everyone who attended today and we peaked at just under 200 participants i'd like to thank our guest speakers margaret annabelle and Brody for generously sharing their knowledge, stories and their time. I'd also like to thank all, our, all of our participants for joining and just to give you a reminder that we'll be sending you a link to a recording of this webinar and it will be added to the recovery collection on the Ada Knowledge Hub. We'd like to keep finding out from you what topics you would like us to cover in future recovery webinars. So you will see a short survey appear when you exit the webinar and we encourage you to fill this in. Thank you all and have a good afternoon.